In today's uh, video, we are going to talk about everyone's favorite momentum stock, Tesla. And I'm going to highlight a catalyst that potentially could lead to the next large pullback in the stock and a good entry point for those looking to capture a larger, longer term move. If you're interested in catching Tesla in the next big pullback, stick around. Hi, I'm Steven Spencer. I'm a partner at SMB Capital. We're a proprietary trading firm in New York City where we trade stocks, futures, and options. For the most part, there are two things, broadly speaking, that will create a sustainable move in a momentum stock. The first thing is a real catalyst. A real catalyst is a piece of news that momentum investors and traders believe is a real reflection of the underlying performance of a company. One example is either margin expansion or contraction. Another example is acceleration or deceleration of sales growth. These items can create a sustainable move in either direction. Unlike other news items that don't truly reflect the performance of the business and are temporary in nature, these sorts of catalysts can lead to a sustained trend. Technical examples I don't really need to get into today. We've covered this sort of thing in many of the other videos we've produced, and I'm sure others on YouTube have discussed these setups as well. What I'm trying to do with this video is give you some insight into how larger market players, people who are managing $100 million plus, are moved to put on risk. I'm going to use Tesla as an example to illustrate this concept, mainly because I've been long Tesla for about a year now, and I prepared to add to my position in each of the potential real catalysts that we're going to talk about today. As I outline a few of these examples seen in the past year, you need to understand that when you apply the broader principles to momentum stock, that the specific examples will be unique to the company we are looking at. Investors have their favorite metrics that they will focus on for a particular company. So what we look at in Tesla wouldn't necessarily be the same thing as Netflix, for example. The two most important metrics investors have looked at for Tesla are quarterly deliveries and gross vehicle margins. Quarterly delivery numbers give investors a snapshot of the growth of Tesla. Gross vehicle margins answer the question as to whether Tesla can be a profitable company longer term. One other metric investors have paid closer attention to since 2018 has been free cash flow. As Tesla introduced their mass market Model 3, investors were interested to see if the Model 3 growth would allow Tesla to self-fund future investment. In front of every quarterly announcement for those stats, what I do is I game plan my trades versus the expectations for those numbers. So I'll come up with a bearish, I'll come up with bearish scenarios, I'll come up with bullish scenarios, and neutral scenarios. I'll use those estimates to prepare me to buy or sell as soon as those numbers are released. It also prepares me for market mistakes. What is a market mistake, you may wonder? Let's say, for example, Tesla releases a bullish delivery number. They beat delivery expectations by 10%, but Tesla drops in price immediately following the release of that piece of news. This is great. With a positive catalyst like a strong delivery beat, I want to get long Tesla. If the first reaction is a drop in price, when I'm able or I'm gifted by the market a better entry price than I should be, I'm going to get aggressively long because my risk reward is greatly enhanced. The same thing applies in reverse. Although getting short as a momentum stock moves higher on what you perceive as disappointing numbers tends to be more difficult. Let's look at a few charts and some recent examples of Tesla delivery numbers and so we can gain some insight because at the end of the video what I'm going to do is give you a preview of potentially what the Q1 delivery numbers are going to be and what potentially could be an opportunity for a large pullback in Tesla where we'll be able to put on longer term positions. The first chart that we're going to look at is Q2 2019 um, reaction to the delivery numbers. And I've also included the stats for you to take a look at. So the stats were, they came in at 95.2 thousand in deliveries. The estimates were for 84, so they beat that pretty handily by about 10%. And they also guided um, for Q3 to 90 to 100, basically saying conservative guidance, but 
at least in line with what we had just seen. Um, and what we need to understand at this point when we're, looking, when we're looking at the chart is the prior quarter, Q1, was when they missed on the numbers and it caused the stock basically to start a down move. It was in the high 200s at that point and eventually worked its way all the way down to below $200 a share. And so, and actually what we're looking at here is on the left side of the chart, you can see that down move from 260 all the way down to 180. That's when I started building a longer term long position and it bounced back up and coming into Q2, it had already bounced from 180 um, all the way back up to, to 220. And so I, I, in the chart here, you can see we highlighted, we circled um, when they actually announced the delivery numbers. You can see that day it, it gapped higher above 240, I believe, and started to sell off. But then in the coming weeks, you can see that it moved to above 260 a share. And so I want to talk about two things. The, I mean, the main purpose of this video, um, I had promised on Twitter actually that I would give you an example well in advance of potentially where we can pick up Tesla on a larger pullback. Um, and that, that catalyst is going to happen. I mean, the cat's out of the bag now. We're going to look at Q2, Q3, and Q4. And when we do that, I think that's going to prepare you and set you up to how to handle the Q1 delivery numbers that are going to come out probably around April 2nd or 3rd or something like that. And remember, when we're looking, as we're walking forward in 2019, remember what the psychology was coming into the Q2 delivery numbers. The, rever the psychology was really bearish. The stock had sold off from 300 to below $200 a share um, because of the poor Q1, but also some other things, you know, Musk just doing some things on Twitter, um, people getting confused as to the behavior of the company and their CEO. And so the, there was a very negative, bearish tone and sentiment in the psychology. And as I think as we walk forward through 2019, you'll see it was very slow, the psychology to shift. Um, didn't really get to very positive until the final month of the year. Um, and that's going to impact how we trade um, when delivery numbers come out as well. So it has a decent bounce. It's above, you know, coming in, you can see I kind of highlighted that area where they were accumulating it between 220 and 225. Um, before the number gets it reported. They do the delivery number, they beat it pretty handily, and it gaps up. Now, if the psychology was good at this point, the thing would have gapped up and probably would have just gone straight up to 260. But instead, because the psychology is still pretty not great, um, it gaps up and it's actually sold. But the good thing about it was at that point, we had been using 225 to 220 as an area we wanted to buy into, into a pullback. So that's bigger picture. If we zoom in, and I can show you the actual reaction when we're trading this in the after hours and the number comes out when they do a delivery number and they beat, we're looking to get long uh, into a pop in the stock, but understand we don't really want to pay above kind of an area that we've highlighted for where the stock's been accumulated recently. And so you can see as we zoomed in, as they reported those delivery numbers for Q2, it immediately pops to 228 and the second pop takes it to above the recent high, which was 233. In this situation, I don't want to be, uh, if it gaps immediately to above 233, I'm really not going to chase the stock. But in this case, you can see at 415, when the number gets reported, it pops to 228. It's a number I'm comfortable being long. And if it holds there and then breaks to the upside and gets above the recent high of 233, that's going to be a momentum buy. And we're going to look to basically, in this case, we're looking to play it up to 240. You can see it got above 240. Um, then a little bit later in the after hours, it got to 245 before it full, pulled back into 240. Um, and so the next day, our thought process was if it pulls back into 232, 233, we'll get long there and see if it starts up an uptrend. And, and again, the first chart you looked at, you can see that it actually pulled back that day. They sold it off um, to the low 230s. And over the next couple of days, it actually came in a little bit more. Um, but eventually, the, the strong delivery numbers took over over the next two weeks, and it traded up to 260. So and in terms of the psychology not being that positive, what you can see is after they released the delivery numbers for Q2, you can see a bunch of um, analysts still negative on the stock. There's a couple that are positive. Uh, Canaccord Genuity reiterated their 394 target. Nomura neutral. I'm not sure why they were neutral with a 300 target when it was still at 220 with 25% uh, of upside. JMP market outperformed 347. But look at um, Wedbush 230 target. Tier one, they say that's Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley probably doesn't like trade the news, use their name. So they say tier one, reiterates underperform. No one has been more wrong about Morgan Stanley other than JP Morgan on this stock. So they reiterated 225. So you vote. Uh, and then, oh, Credit Suisse, actually, maybe they've been more wrong than JP Morgan. They reiterated 189. So you have four big 
firms putting on price targets of 190 to 230 when they just really crushed their delivery numbers and had positive cash flow, I think, of about 600 million. So psychology is still negative. Then we get to Q3. A couple of things, we've got to set this up for you. So the stock is still trading basically between 220 and 250 coming into the Q3 delivery numbers. And a week before the Q3 number, delivery numbers come out, uh, Elon Musk, there's a leaked email where he says we have a shot at delivering 100,000 would be a new records for delivery. So they run the stock up in front of the earnings to, so you see I highlighted there, there's the uh, leaked email. We might hit 100,000, they pop it to $250 a share. And for a few days, it's being accumulated above 240, which was kind of the level where we highlighted for Q2 where um, it had moved up. So they're accumulating it. And then the delivery announcement comes out, and it's good, it's solid. Their guidance had been 90 to 100. It comes out, they're at 97. Their production was 96. So they actually delivered more, more cars than they produced, um, which is strong. You know, they're above the midpoint. But because of that Musk leaked email, um, which they, they said they had a shot at 100, I think people were thinking they were going to do 100, 102, something like that. Um, but the great thing about that was it gave us an opportunity to again buy it at 225, which had been our kind of our go-to price for the last couple of months. So you can see when the market opens the next day, um, it drops down to 225, and we got long there. And you can see it shakes off the disappointment of Musk saying maybe they hit 100, and people are saying, wow, that's two good quarters in a row, positive cash flow, although the cash flow wasn't as positive as the prior quarter, but they're making money and went right back up to the 245 resistance. But it shows you, again, Q, Q2 um, coming in, we have the Q1 disappointment. When they actually hit good numbers, really you know, positive reaction, um, they ran it up quite a bit. The next quarter, it, was, it had moved higher already to 240 to 245. Disappointing delivery number moves lower, but again, um, it's still trading at pretty low prices, and so the next morning there was an opportunity to pick it up at 225. Um, now this is the big one, so we're going to move forward. So coming into Q4, the expectation was perhaps they could finally hit 100,000, um, and if they got over 100,000, this would be a positive catalyst. They report production of around 105,000 for the quarter versus um, 96 the prior quarter. So this is two quarters in a row, by the way. They've, uh, in the last two quarters, they've gone from production levels of 87 to 96 to 105. So each quarter, they're moving up about seven, 8,000 in terms of production. So they're increasing production, and they delivered 112,000. Um, they basically, every car they produced, plus every car in inventory they produced, they, they delivered, and it was just a complete blowout. You probably saw me on Twitter after this number. I was actually surprised that it wasn't pretty much above 600 right away. And we'll take a look at the charts in a second. They say they've delivered the, the 112,000. And you can see immediately the stock spikes up um, to 440. The market opens and it goes to 450. Um, if we go to the next chart, what you can see here is coming into that announcement um, where had the stock been trading in the prior days? And you can see that it had topped out just above 4.30. Um, and then a few days before the delivery, the funny thing happened was NEO, I think in China, gave some bad numbers and the stock, um, stock kind of sold off a little bit. So in this case, um, with the record delivery numbers, what you wanted to do was, as soon as it popped above 4.30, get long there and kind of see, see how high it was going, going to go. We had very bullish tone. Um, we had, they delivered everything they produced plus everything in inventory. And then really what people were waiting for, again, these numbers are delivered on, these are, these are released on January 3rd, is in the third week in January, they typically are the third week, three weeks after the delivery number, they do their earnings. And coming into that earnings, our thought process was basically, there were a 5.3 billion in cash coming into um, Q4 that, if they got to six billion, pretty much it would be bonanzas. And what we just showed you was it had run up from 400 to 450 on the delivery numbers. But meanwhile, in the three weeks from when they reported the delivery numbers, the stock went up another like $130 from 450 to 580. And so it was acting like it was anticipating really, they thought the financial performance was going to be really good. 
Here's the financial performance. People were expecting $1.60. They did $2.15. As I said, um, here's actually the cash flow numbers. You can see that um, the prior quarter, the free cash flow, which is cash flow minus cap capital expenditures, was $3.70. Well, in Q4, they just, I mean, they blew it out of the park. They did a billion dollars in free cash flow, and they had over $6.2 billion in the bank of cash and securities. And our, our kind of buy on the news was if they just had over $6 billion in cash, because cash had been a big deal. You can see that on the left side, in Q1, they drew down from um, $3.7 billion in cash. The next quarter, they had a negative nine hundred, and they were down to two point two before they did a capital raise. And the next quarter, you can see they did a capital raise, plus they did $600 million in free cash flow. Um, and in Q3, as they were kind of ramping up building the Shanghai facility, the, the free cash flow numbers came down. Um, but once they got above $6, 6 billion, we were just buy. And you can basically see, if you look at this chart right here, what you can see is um, coming into the number, it was at 580. So it had run up. The, the, the last chart I showed you was delivery numbers, nice pop, got above you know, 450. And over the next three weeks before they released the earnings number, um, it had already run up $130. So they were going to really have to crush these earnings numbers and the free cash flow numbers for people to want to buy it. And they did. Um, also, a funny part of it about it was the, um, the earnings squat guy um, initially said they, they, they missed expectations, which was confusing because um, the number sounded really good to me. Um, but then you can see it was a bit of a delayed reaction. It took about three or four minutes for it to pop above 600. And then it held at 620, and then the second leg took it to 650. And since then, we know what's happened. The stock traded up to 960, came back down to 700, and buyers are pretty much back in control. As I'm making this video, I think it closed today at $900 a share. Here we are. The stock basically, you know, it doubled from 350 to 700, and then from 700, it actually went vertical to 960, came back down, did a test of 700 again. Um, a few days ago, they ran it up to 940, made a little bit of a lower high, um, and we got a nice pullback um, yesterday to um, 860, and we ran it back up to 900 again. So there's basically the two real catalysts for this stock are the delivery numbers that usually gets reported two to four business days after the close of the quarter. And then three weeks later, they give their earnings numbers. And when they do the earnings numbers, that's when they look at the gross margins of the vehicles and then also the free cash flow. It used to just be, and the reason why people look at the, mar the gross margins and the free cash flow is it's representative of the longer term health of the business and the momentum hedge funds and the momentum investors want to know, you know, what is the run rate? So if they did a billion last quarter, oh, the run, the annual run rate, if you multiply that times four, is four billion of free cash flow. For a growth company, sometimes that could be, could trade at 40 to 50 times their annualized free cash flow. Do the math there. Right now it's actually trading at 40 times, right around the market caps around 160 billion. At 50, that's 200 billion. That's the stock at over $1,100 a share. So, and, you know, one, one of the curious things about this stock is the, the, most of the analysts that cover it are these car analysts. And I, I've never seen, you know, a technology momentum stock, you know, people who cover like Netflix or Amazon, and some of those analysts are not good either. But when, you're, when they're covering this Tesla, and most of them are automotive analysts, and even the ones who are pretty good on it that have like $700, $800 targets, they're just not, they don't really quite understand the business. And so at, at the end of the video, I'm going to show you three places where you can watch their videos on YouTube that are very good. They understand how the company, the fundamentals. And if you want to prepare for the first week of April when they produce their next deliveries and then their, their Q1 earnings to understand the longer term fundamentals of this company and kind of how it's moved from 300 to 900 um, and in the future how it can move higher, I'll give you three um, YouTube channels. So before we get into kind of talking about the deliveries for Q1 and how to buy it into the next pullback, um, reminder, we are running the two-hour free workshop um, where I actually discuss for 30 minutes my entire process of how I select stocks each day. Um, and we also do three of the low-risk, high-reward trading setups that the top traders on our desk uh, use to make money on a day-in, day-out basis. Here is a chart of the delivery numbers going back the last few years in Tesla. What you can see is the one that I circled and highlighted for you was the Q1 week quarter that they had in 2019, which was basically because they had an expiration of their $7,500 vehicle tax credit. So basically maybe 20,000 sales were pulled forward to the prior quarter 
and it made Q1 look unusually weak um, because of that pull forward. And then in Q2, when the growth resumed, and the stock probably should have at that point been moving back up to three, four hundred dollars a share because the psychology was so negative after that Q1 and all the things that I talked about earlier in the video. It actually took, um, let's see, November. It took it basically took two months before it started to trend higher, um, and then finally the thing that was really got the you know the, the psychology is so positive in Tesla right now that that final one all the way to the right, the 112 delivery number, that was the final piece that really got the trend to begin um, to, to, six, to 580, and then they released their, their numbers, and that's what got it to go up to $900 a share. So the great thing about this is we finally actually have a pretty good setup where this thing could actually get hit pretty good because Q1 is um, seasonally really a weakest quarter. In the car industry, people buy less cars in Q1. We also know that they sold everything out of inventory in Q4. Um, they've already said that we're going to produce more cars than we sell. And right now, estimates coming in to the last that I checked was they were going to deliver 105,000 cars for Q1. This seems very unrealistic to me. The, the only way that they're going to possibly do that if they, is they deliver every car they produced at the end of 2019 in China, and they really ramped production in China in Q1. But guess what? What's going on in China right now? Half of China is shut down because of the coronavirus. So you have half of China shut down. I think the plant in Shanghai, and Tesla plant in Shanghai, was shut down for two weeks. Um, and so you have those things going on with the seasonally weak quarter. So basically, I've already developed my own mental framework. And as we get closer to the first week of April, I will share with you via Twitter um, what my thoughts are. Because right now, we're at $900 a share. Hopefully, what will happen is before, over the next month, this thing will pull back to 800 750 to 800 So coming into that, Coming into that delivery number, if we get a weak delivery number, we'll even get a, a sharper pullback into the 600s. Now, all bets are off. If this thing moves up to like 1,100, and then going in front of Q1 delivery numbers is has only pulled back maybe to like 850 to 900, or not even 950, there's no way it's getting it back into the 600s. But um, it can have a 10 to 15 percent pullback on a weak Q1 delivery number. And again, I will share that with you um, as we get into the first week of April. But that's the next potential catalyst, short of Elon Musk resigning from Tesla. Um, if this thing's going to have like a really nice, clean technical pullback on news, and that's 10 to 15 percent would be what I'm leaning towards, unless the number's a disaster, like let's say below, I'd say below 90,000 deliveries, um, maybe you would get like 18 to 20 percent. Um, if they do over 100,000, even though that's below the consensus where it is right now, I think you might get a quick wick down and then it, it's off to the races again. And if they somehow beat the, the current consensus, which I would expect to come down over the next few weeks in the coming weeks, if they somehow beat that 105 and somehow do 110, um, the stock's probably going to go up you know, easily 10 to 15 percent, um, unless it's already trading above 1,000 at that point. Um, but that's going to be the next great point. Uh, potentially to get in if you're looking for you know capturing a longer longer term move and that's all I've been using these catalysts for each quarter is you know for a spot to basically build more of a longer term position. Um, hopefully, for those of you who are interested from you know a longer term perspective, how to get involved in a momentum stock, who don't want to chase it to the upside, um, you can use kind of this longer term chart and understand the prices that I highlighted there. Um, we had the top at 960, we had the lower high at 940. You can see the uptrend over the next few weeks. It's going to work its way to $800 a share. Um, if we can kind of break that, that bigger picture uptrend, you know, we can get a pullback again to, into that 650, 700 area. Oh, and I promised you, I'm sorry, the three YouTube channels that I promised. Number one, solving the money problem. Um, the person who does this channel, he's great, bigger picture. He understands. He's been involved for Tesla for years. He's going to give you really good analysis kind of on the business model, where things are heading over the next few years. Great videos. The second one is known as HyperChange. This is focused on um, technology companies, disruptive companies. I'd say about half of um, his videos are related to Tesla. Does a really nice job previewing potential earnings for the quarter in terms of breaking down the margins um, and things like that. I think I've highlighted some of his videos in the past. Especially in October, I think I highlighted his quarterly analysis when the stock was still trading down to 300. I think if people watched that video, it would have been pretty clear that this thing had the potential to go a lot higher. And then finally, the Tesla Daily Podcast um, covers all the analyst upgrades and downgrades where they are. By the way, on the analysts, they've moved up their prices now. A lot of analysts, not a lot, but some are in the 7 to 900 range. 
So I think the average target has probably moved up to the 550, 600. So the average analyst target was down at 250 a couple months ago, then it moved to 350, and I think now we're in the 550s, if I had to guess. But as those targets kind of work their way up to kind of 700, if we can get a negative catalyst, like the Q1, Q1 production delivery numbers, um, maybe that what will happen is the analyst price targets will have moved up to a level where then it will sell off and they'll meet, and that'll be where everybody tries to get long again from a longer big picture perspective. Um, see you next time.